Chapter 1. For Bitcoin to establish itself as the currency of the digital age, it must fend off enemies, foreign and domestic. While Bitcoin continues to scare financial regulators as it threatens to take power from these established bodies and give people privacy and freedom, it must also carve a good image among the people it depends on to survive. Within the crypto community, there are two major divergent views on how cryptocurrency should be run. On the one hand, there are the venture capitalists who believe digital money must be well-regulated and compliant with government laws. The chief advocates of this school of thought are Tyler and Cameron Winklevoss. There are two divergent views, Bitcoin as part of the financial sector and Bitcoin as the end of the financial sector. On the other side of the divide, there are the libertarians and anarchists who believe that the government should not have control over what people do with their money. Thus, they see Bitcoin as a way to grant true freedom to the people. A chief advocate of this view is Roger Ver, known in the Bitcoin community as Bitcoin Jesus, because of his proselytizing and the many investments he'd made in the industry. Bitcoin Billionaires provides a dramatic narration of the story of the struggles Bitcoin had to go through, and how Tyler and Cameron Winklevoss became the first Bitcoin billionaires as a result of a cascade of events that turned out in their favor. Tyler and Cameron Winklevoss have become leaders of an entirely new digital revolution. Bitcoin and the technology behind it has the capacity to upend the internet. This summary tells a different story from a book written in 2010, The Accidental Billionaires, The Founding of Facebook. Mark Zuckerberg was the revolutionary of that story, while the Winklevoss twins represented the establishment. In Bitcoin Billionaires, the twins are the heroes of the story, while Mark Zuckerberg is the establishment. Chapter 2. The Winklevoss twins engage in a futile search for startups to invest in after the Facebook saga. Following the acceptance of Mark Zuckerberg's settlement offers, the Winklevoss twins moved to New York to start a venture capitalist company called Winklevoss Capital. They were excited by the prospect of financing startups and helping them grow. In their excitement, they reached out to as many startups as they could. However, no matter how hard they tried, the twins could not get a startup to invest in. Some of the startups were already booked. The available ones already found one reason or the other to reject their money. It was a meeting with Jake Rubin, a young CEO of a startup in the virtual reality industry, that opened their eyes. Rubin told them, your dollars might be green, but they're marked. Though Winklevoss' public history with Facebook prevented Winklevoss Capital from making viable investments, the twins realized at that meeting that their media representation had tainted people's view of them. No matter how much they offered, no startup would accept their money. This presented a huge obstacle to their dreams as venture capitalists. They decided to take a vacation in Ibiza to ease their frustration and plan their next business approach. Chapter 3 The Winklevoss twins were set on a course that would make them billionaires in the unlikeliest of places. At a party in Ibiza, David Azar, an entrepreneur from Brooklyn who owned a check cashing business, approached the twins to discuss a digital revolution. The revolution was a social network that would change the way people lived their lives. Due to their experience with Facebook, the twins were reluctant to listen to him. Azar managed to grab their attention by bringing out a dollar note and telling the twins he wanted to talk about the oldest social network on earth. Azar explained that money connects people. As such, it is a social network. He then introduced Bitcoin as the future of that network. Bitcoin is virtual cash that is maintained by a network of individual computers. Bitcoin is a form of digital currency that does not rely on banks and government to exist and function. It is a cheap, fast, and reliable way to store, receive, and spend money without middlemen. It is maintained through a network of individual computers that are connected to a blockchain. It is these computers scattered over the world which ensures Bitcoin operates the way it should. That is what makes Bitcoin immune to government interference. The twins got interested. They interviewed professors who revealed they had never heard of Bitcoin, so they conducted their own research using the scanty resources on the internet. Azar led the twins to Charlie Schrem, the young CEO of BitInstant. BitInstant was a platform that allowed people to buy Bitcoin with ease. The twins' first contact with Charlie Schrem was via a conference call. Other participants were David Azar, who had introduced the twins to Bitcoin, and Eric Voorhees, Schrem's head of marketing. The conference call steered around the concept of Bitcoin as money and its advantages over paper money and gold. The twins learned that Roger Ver had invested $150,000 in BitInstant for 15% ownership of the company. 
At that time, they were yet to have a conversation with Ver, aside a few emails. They decided they were going to give BitInstant and Bitcoin a chance. Chapter 4 The Winklevoss twins invested heavily in Bitcoin once they were sold on the idea. Charlie Schrem's partners, Ver and Voorhees, were not enthusiastic about bringing the Winklevoss twins into the company. However, since it was his company, it was up to him to make the final decision. And he chose the Winklevoss twins. The twins decided to invest $800,000 for 22% ownership of the company. They then asked Charlie to begin purchasing Bitcoin on their behalf. First, they asked for $100 worth of Bitcoin to test the service. Then, they moved to $100,000 and they kept on buying until they had invested over $750,000 into buying Bitcoin. Still, the twins wanted more. Schramm could not keep up with demand and referred the twins to Mt. Gox, a Japanese-based exchange. BitInstant and Mt. Gox used to be the only popular means of purchasing Bitcoin. Now, there are more. Mt. Gox was the largest Bitcoin exchange of its time. It accounted for roughly 80% of all Bitcoin trades. It was the only platform that could match the twins' appetite for Bitcoin. Schramm helped them accelerate the registration and deposit processes. Before long, the twins were buying Bitcoin on their own. Chapter 5 The financial crash that happened on the island of Cyprus became a tipping point for the Bitcoin concept. On March 16, 2013, citizens in Cyprus woke up to a terrifying morning. The banks were taking percentages of their deposits to service the country's debt. This was a debt caused by the bank's reckless business practices. The European Union offer of a bailout came with the condition that Cypriot banks come up with a percentage of the funds needed. The result was a countrywide panic as customers could not access their funds. The banking halls were closed and the ATMs were empty. Some of the customers lost more than half of their savings. The search for a form of money outside the control of banks shined a spotlight on Bitcoin. People began to seek alternatives that were outside of governmental interference and control of banks. That search turned the world's attention to Bitcoin. Bitcoin does not rely on a central authority to function. As such, there was no way what happened to the deposits in Cypriot banks could occur to funds in Bitcoin wallets. Because Bitcoin has a limited supply, the increased demand led to an increase in price. The twins had invested over $10 million in buying Bitcoin. Their Bitcoin was now worth over $40 million. People saw Bitcoin as a better alternative, as it was outside the control of banks and governments, and new attention and demand caused Bitcoin's price to rise. Chapter 6 The Winklevoss twins became the face of Bitcoin as they began widespread proselytizing. During and after the financial crisis in Cyprus, the Winklevoss twins had been at the force of driving Bitcoin adoption into mainstream finance. They believed Bitcoin's potential for growth can be harnessed when it is compliant with relevant laws and easily accessible to people around the world. We have elected to put our money and faith in a mathematical framework that is free of politics and human error. Ben Mesrick Tyler got a mysterious email inviting them to a meeting at the Genesis Block on May 16, 2013. The Genesis Block, as the twins found out, was a man cave that brought together geniuses from the tech community and angel investors with a lot of money. They had been invited by Naval Ravikant, a serial angel investor and entrepreneur. The gathering was co-hosted by Bill Lee, a Taiwanese-American entrepreneur and investor who sold his first company for $265 million during the dot-com frenzy in the late 1990s. The gathering was a significant one. Ravikant described it as Bitcoiners Anonymous, a support group for engineers and entrepreneurs suffering from a crypto addiction. They are the Silicon Valley outsiders who built the protocols and tools that power the internet, roadies of the internet. They welcomed the twins as early adopters and were the direct opposite of the Valley establishment who treated them like malware because of their indaluable connection to Mark Zuckerberg. With time and proof of success, more people will welcome your ideas. Did you know, the Genesis block is the name used in the Bitcoin community to describe the first block of the Bitcoin blockchain. It was mined by Satoshi Nakamoto himself back in 2009. Chapter 7 A point of divergence among Bitcoin faithful is whether to be compliant or to choose deviance. Everyone in the Genesis block was optimistic that Bitcoin would eventually become a global currency and blockchain technology would soon be ubiquitous. 
They all agreed that this was a critical time for crypto and Bitcoin would need to reach escape velocity as soon as possible, if it were not killed by the powers that be. Bitcoin was gold 2.0, and gold was money 1.0, with a 10,000-year first-mover advantage. The world was listening, and Bitcoin needed to send the right message if it would oust the establishment. Wall Street, Visa, American Express, Western Union, governments, even PayPal. They had the most to lose if Bitcoin succeeded. For Bitcoin to grow quickly, the right people need to say the right things to the people who have doubts. There was a Bitcoin 2013 conference at the San Jose McEnergy Convention Center in San Francisco. The crowd was made up of people interested in Bitcoin, developers, Bitcoin miners, libertarians, cryptographers, and the financial press. Having people like the Winklevoss twins speak positively about Bitcoin gave it a lot of credibility. For the twins, Bitcoin was not about circumventing government laws, but creating a digital money that fits a digital age. But Charlie Schrem did not share the same beliefs. He believed Bitcoin will overturn everything, but at the same time, he felt the need to be compliant. This also represents the two major schools of thought in the cryptocurrency world, libertarians and the compliant group. Chapter 8 The Winklevoss twins carried on with their plans to legitimize Bitcoin by applying for a Bitcoin exchange-traded fund. Six weeks after the high of Bitcoin 2013, the business section of the New York Times read, Winklevoss twins plan first fund for Bitcoin. The twins had just filed a registration statement for the Winklevoss Bitcoin Trust with the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission, SEC, to create a Bitcoin ETF, an exchange-traded fund that would allow anyone to purchase Bitcoin as easily as they could buy a stock. If the regulators approved this request, it would bypass the shadowy process that existed at the moment, like having to go to shady exchanges like Mt. Gox or BitInstant. Buying shares in an ETF was typically the way investors got exposure to commodities and precious metals like gold. The first gold ETF had in fact launched back in 2004, under the ticker symbol GLD. It was an enormous success. By making it easy for people to invest in the metal, it had ushered in unprecedented amounts of liquidity and investor interest, totally transforming the gold market. You no longer needed to go through the trouble of buying a bar of gold, storing it in a safe at your home, and worrying if the plumber was going to rob you when you weren't there. With GLD, all you had to do was call your stockbroker, or better yet, go online to E-Trade, Charles Schwab, or Fidelity, and type these three letters in before pressing the buy button. That's how simple the Winklevoss twins wanted to make buying Bitcoin. Except for the twins' ETF, the ticker symbol would be four letters instead of three. C-O-I-N. Tyler knew that if COIN ever got through the regulatory hurdles and was approved, it would be a game changer. They would have succeeded in bringing Bitcoin to the masses. As the New York Times also pointed out, it was a direct effort to remove the stigma hovering over Bitcoin and put it right into the laps of regulators. The ETF filing wasn't just going to send a signal to the legacy banking community that Bitcoin was on its way into the mainstream. The filing would also etch a permanent line down the middle of the Bitcoin world. Between people like the twins, who knew that Bitcoin's future had to include regulation, and those who believed Bitcoin was meant to exist apart from Wall Street, the SEC, or any other regulator or government, the Winklevoss Bitcoin Trust was a preemptive strike, meant to end the war before it began. The Bitcoin ETF was an attempt to end the war between the financial sector and Bitcoin before the war began. Chapter 9 On October 1st, 2013, Ross Ulbricht, a.k.a. Dread Pirate Roberts, was nabbed by the FBI, and this caused a nosedive in Bitcoin price. Ross Albrecht was 29 years old when he was arrested by the FBI. They charged him with money laundering, computer hacking, conspiracy to traffic narcotics, and procuring murder. He had been ID'd as the mogul behind the biggest illegal drug bazaar in history. The FBI also pinned the creation of Silk Road on him, even though he denied creating the platform. Silk Road was a website created for people to trade without any government regulation. Aside being against the law, illegal activities can be detrimental to business and wealth creation. The news of the takedown of Silk Road by the FBI reverberated throughout the Bitcoin economy. The price of Bitcoin started to drop rapidly. The price of a single Bitcoin had started the morning at around $145 a coin. But since the news of Albrecht's arrest, the price had begun to spiral downward. Now it was approaching $110 per coin. That meant the economy had shed more than $700 million in value in just a matter of hours. The twins themselves had lost millions of dollars on paper. But Cameron kept his mind on the bigger picture. While others were dumping their Bitcoin, the twins were buying. They had a strong conviction that the drop was temporary. With legitimacy on the horizon and the fall of the illegal empire that had tainted Bitcoin, all the twins could see was a bright future, and they latched on to that hope. Chapter 10. The Winklevoss twins were subjected to many legal checks because of their Bitcoin ideas. After getting over their initial dismay at being subpoenaed by the government for the first time in their lives, and finding out about it from the press, 
the Winklevoss twins quickly discovered that it had not been meant as an accusation of wrongdoing or criminal activities. In fact, the request for documentation, and later for them to testify in front of the superintendent, was a real opportunity. The twins had been chosen as representatives of the new virtual economy to help the Department of Financial Services understand Bitcoin and virtual currency, and help shape what sort of regulations were necessary, now that Bitcoin was becoming an unavoidable part of New York City's financial landscape. In a way, the subpoena was actually an honor that had been bestowed on the twins. As Forbes magazine had headlined, every important person in Bitcoin just got subpoenaed by New York's financial regulator. Among the people and companies subpoenaed were venture capitalists Mark Andreessen and Ben Horowitz, along with the founders of Coinbase, BitPay, CoinLab, Coinsetter, Dwala, Payward, ZipZap, BoostVC, and even Peter Thiel's Founders Fund. Pretty much a who's who of everyone who had made a major investment in or ran a major company in the Bitcoin space. As an entrepreneur, you had one, maybe two, but usually not more than three chances to catch lightning in a bottle. As a venture capitalist, however, you could chase lightning as long as you had cash to invest. Ben Mesrick. On the other hand, Charlie Schrem was arrested at JFK as he was making his way back to New York with his girlfriend, Courtney. He was arraigned in court with a three-count charge of money laundering, failure to file suspicious activity reports, and operating an unlicensed money transmitter. Almost immediately, the twins disavowed Charlie Schrem and bit instant with a statement that clearly stated their intention to help law enforcement officials in any way possible. The libertarians and anarchists saw Bitcoin as a weapon in their war against regulated society. The entrepreneurs and VCs increasingly gravitating toward cryptocurrency wanted Bitcoin to be part of that society, a new programmable money for the modern world. The arrest of Charlie Schramm made the subpoena hearing all the more difficult. The VCs in attendance had to fight for the life of Bitcoin. The public hearing was headed by Superintendent Lossky and was being simulcasted to over 130 countries. The goal of the hearing was to put forward a proposed regulatory framework for virtual currency firms operating in the state of New York. Lossky's first question was, is it that any technology can have bad people who are going to allegedly use it in bad ways? Drug dealers use cell phones. It doesn't mean we condemn the cell phone. Terrorists use computers. Although there are arguments that virtual currency is more susceptible, what we don't want is a world where Bitcoin is a haven for those committing illicit activities. Just like technology, Bitcoin is a tool that can be used for good or bad by people. There was a narration of the changes in the character of the people involved in Bitcoin. Bitcoin started out as an academic novelty, as a decentralized, open-source network. It attracted libertarians and radicals. The anonymity it provided opened doors for people who thought they could conceal their behavior behind Bitcoin. The reduction of transaction costs and its programmability changed the nature of the Bitcoin population. One of them described the five stages of Bitcoin. First, development of the open-source community. A geeky, nerdy, crypto-libertarian thing, 2009-2010. to 2010. Second, a vice phase. Silk Road, drug trafficking, gun running, 2010 to 2011. The third phase, speculation, trading, 2013, 2014. Next phase is the transactional phase, real merchants accepting Bitcoin. And the final phase is the phase of programmable money, when money can move via a programmable infrastructure. Chapter 11. The Winklevoss brothers founded Gemini, a fully regulated, fully compliant virtual currency exchange headquartered in New York. Once Silk Road had gone down, Mount Gox had become Bitcoin's biggest liability. And then, two weeks after Charlie Schramm's arrest and the legal hearings where the twins had spoken in front of Lossky and the regulators, Mt. Gox collapsed. 800,000 Bitcoin had been looted from customers' accounts by sophisticated hackers, a loss worth over $450 million at the time. After the fall of Mt. Gox, the twins had become convinced that Bitcoin desperately needed a new wave of entrepreneurs and companies that could sweep away the broken pieces of that first wave. The twins believed that for an exchange to be successful, it needed four fundamental pillars seared into its DNA. Licensing, Compliance, Security, and Technology. On January 23, 2015, Cameron Winklevoss announced Gemini, a next-generation Bitcoin exchange. It was fully regulated, fully compliant, New York-based Bitcoin exchange for both individuals and institutions alike. They not only founded Gemini, but also invested heavily in it through Winklevoss Capital. Although their ETF was still a dream, Gemini was humming along, and over the past year, the price of Bitcoin had been enjoying a steady rise since January 2017. By November, Bitcoin hit $10,000 a coin. Regulation around cryptocurrencies had gotten clearer, and most people didn't believe that governments around the world were going to outlaw the new forms of money. More and better entrepreneurs had moved into the space, built more infrastructure, making it easy to buy, sell, and store Bitcoin. There was a greater level of education. People had started to see that Silk Road wasn't Bitcoin, that there was so much more to technology. With education comes knowledge and the conviction to do the right things. The calculation wasn't hard for Cameron Winklevoss to make in his head. As of that moment, the entire market cap of Bitcoin had reached over $200 billion. Beginning in 2011, they had acquired 1% of the market. And since they'd started buying the virtual currency, they hadn't sold a single Bitcoin. Cameron and Tyler Winklevoss had just officially become the world's first known Bitcoin billionaires. Conclusion 
Gemini, the crypto exchange founded by Bitcoin billionaires, Tyler and Cameron Winklevoss, has over 200 employees and continues to grow. It is the most regulated crypto exchange and custodian in the world, with a valuation that stands at over a billion dollars. The twins continue to advocate for Bitcoin with the belief that it still has a long way to go. To them, Bitcoin is gold 2.0 and is currently valued at only a fraction of the $7 trillion market for gold. The technology behind Bitcoin has only barely begun to infiltrate the financial, technological, and online worlds. The blockchain and the crypto private keys are the technologies that make Bitcoin work, and they have the potential to decentralize not just money, but also data. This means that they can give the internet back to the people. User information will be freed from the siloed monopolies of mega companies like Facebook, Google, Amazon, etc. Ironically, Bitcoin and its hashes may protect users' data from hackers, misuse, and overarching authority, and allows a form of online communication that is entirely and truly free. Try this. Do a thorough check on the investments you have made so far. If you don't have any investments, speak to your local financial expert for advice.